the human ability to reason is a puzzling one. As a species, we've invented logic, mathematics, science, and philosophy. Yet we also suffer from such a long list of cognitive biases that there is an entire Wikipedia page devoted to categorizing them. So which is it? Are we excellent reasoners or are we incurably irrational? Psychologist Philip Johnson Laird has spent a career working out the answer. His theory of mental models both explains how we have the ability to reason correctly, but also why we frequently fail to do so. I recently read Johnson Laird's nearly 600 page book, How We Reason. The book weighs in on an impressive variety of topics related to reasoning, including why do some people reason better than others? Johnson Laird's answer, mental models require working memory. Working memory capacity is both limited and varies between individuals. Why are some reasoning puzzles harder than others? His answer, the more mental models a correct inference requires, the harder it is to deduce. Does reasoning differ between cultures? Johnson Laird argues that the basic mechanisms are universal, but there can be differences in knowledge or strategies that people use. Do people with psychopathologies reason more poorly? Johnson Laird argues it may actually be the opposite. Obsessive compulsives actually reason better when the content of reasoning questions was related to their obsessions. How does visualization impact reasoning? Images often occur alongside reasoning, but imagery itself can actually make reasoning worse. Finally, can we improve our ability to reason? Johnson Laird is cautiously optimistic, suggesting a method based on mental models his research found dramatically improved performance in certain reasoning tasks. To understand these questions and Johnson Laird's proposed answers, let's walk through what the theory of mental models argues, how it differs from some prominent alternatives, and what it implies about how we think. What are mental models? So to understand the theory of mental models, let's look at a basic syllogism. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore... According to Johnson Laird, you reason about questions like these by simulating a possibility described by their premises. As you read the first premise, you generate a mental representation of a few men and assign each of them the property mortal. As you read the second premise, you pick out one of these anonymous men and indicate that it is Socrates. Inspecting this model, we can immediately conclude that Socrates is also mortal. Mental models are not the same things as mental imagery. It isn't necessary to visualize little Athenians and togas, one of whom happens to be Socrates, in order to make the correct inference. Indeed, a property like mortal doesn't even have an immediate visual representation, so it's not obvious how it could be inferred from an image. Mental models are abstract, but they are structured in a way to reflect the situation that they represent. Johnson Laird explains that when we mentally rotate an object, the mental model that we're rotating is a three-dimensional representation of the object. But what we actually see in our mind's eye, of course, is the image that the 3D object generates when it is viewed from a particular vantage point. Mental models are also static. If we have to reason about a dynamic situation, such as the effect of turning a particular gear on the left of a complex machine, we typically simulate each component's effect sequentially. While our imagination often feels like a movie we can play and rewind, our reasoning is probably closer to a static diagram that we draw and erase from. In brief, a mental model is not an image or a movie, but an abstract representation that tries to compactly represent one possibility from the information given. We reason by manipulating these representations, adding properties, moving them around, and inferring conclusions by directly inspecting them. The contents of mental models are conscious, but the mechanisms used to generate and represent them are not. Thus, we can use mental models to reason, but unlike mental imagery, we can't directly report how they're organized in our minds. Why is reasoning possible? And why does it often fail? So I started this book review by noting the puzzle of human reasoning. We're both a species that has invented calculus, but also frequently fails on basic arithmetic. Consider the following question. A bat and a ball cost $1 and 10 cents. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Many people instinctively respond 10 cents, but that can't be right. If the ball costs 10 cents, the bat would need to cost $1 and 10 cents, bringing the total to $1 and 20 cents. The actual answer must be 5 cents, but it's frequently missed by otherwise intelligent respondents. Dual process theory suggests that there are two different psychological mechanisms we use for answering these sorts of questions. System 1 is fast, automatic, and effortless. Because 10 cents and $1 and 10 cents are both in the problem statement, and $1 is the difference, the question immediately provokes a tempting answer to the question. System 2, in contrast, is slow, effortful, and calculating. 
Mental models are a theory of reasoning in this system. Rather than the rapid, intuitive response given by the first system, to use mental models we need to mentally construct the situation described and inspect it to get the right answer. Many failures of reasoning are simply a failure to ignore a tempting system 1 answer and actually work through the question in system 2. But failures don't just occur because we're overly reliant on misleading intuitions. Reasoning failures can also occur when the problem requires us to generate more mental models than we can fit inside our limited working memories. Some reasoning problems are relatively easy, so consider the following. Some of the authors are bakers, all of the bakers are bowlers. What if anything follows from those two statements? The relatively easy deduction, some of the authors are also bowlers, occurs fairly quickly because the conclusion is evident after only constructing a single mental model. But other problems are much more difficult. Consider this one. None of the artists is a beekeeper, all of the beekeepers are chemists. What if anything follows from this? Some people offer invalid conclusions such as none of the chemists is an artist, or more often simply state that nothing interesting follows from those premises, very few, according to Johnson Laird's experiments, draw the correct conclusion that some of the chemists are not artists. Why is this problem so much harder than the first one? The reason is that we need to construct not just one, but three different mental models of possibilities to represent everything that is implied by the premises and compare those mental models to find a statement that is true in all of them. Johnson Laird argues that three mental models are at the outer range of our working memory capacity, so most people will fail these sorts of questions. However, we can augment our working memory by offloading some of the models to pencil and paper. In an intriguing experiment, subjects were given a pencil and paper and given the instruction, try to construct all the possibilities consistent with the given information. This encourages people to generate more models and makes it more likely that a correct inference can be drawn. Johnson Lair compares the performance with reasoning puzzles. Without the benefit of the model method, the participants were right on about two thirds of the trials and they took an average of 24 seconds to evaluate each inference. With the benefit of the method, however, they were right on 95% of the inferences and they took an average of 15 seconds to evaluate each inference. Mental models are cognitively demanding, thus we often fail to construct a mental model and go with a cheap and fast system one response. Or we get bogged down trying to construct all alternative possibilities so that we fail to make a valid deduction. Yet our difficulties in reasoning are not insurmountable. Johnson Laird explains, If humans err so much, how can they be rational enough to invent logic and mathematics and science and technology? At the heart of human rationality are some simple principles that we all recognize. A conclusion must be the case if it holds in all the possibilities compatible with the premises. It doesn't follow from the premises if there is a counterexample to it. That is, a possibility that is consistent with the premises but not with the conclusion. The foundation of our rationality is our knowledge that a single counterexample overturns a conclusion about what must be the case. Comparing mental models with alternative theories. Mental models are a neat theory, but is it true? It's always possible for proponents of a given theory to find compelling evidence in its favor. Sometimes even really bad theories can sound plausible, especially if you haven't devoted a career to noticing their flaws. So what's the status of mental models? So my limited understanding of the situation is that Johnson Laird's theory is one of the leading psychological theories of reasoning, even though it doesn't have the status of a consensus theory. Few theories in psychology do. The principal alternatives, which Johnson Laird spends quite a few pages debating against, are one, formal theories. So in these theories, we reason the same way that logicians do, paying attention to the logical structure of sentences rather than their meaning. Second, Bayesian networks. Bayes' rule is a way of updating your degree of belief when you encounter new evidence. Some theorists argue that our brains implement a version of this rule, which allows them to make inferences with incomplete or uncertain information. And content-specific rules. So instead of broader reasoning faculties, maybe what we have is a different mechanism for different sorts of situations. One prominent theory, for instance, explains reasoning failures in a particular task with the ability to detect rule violations that's more specific than a general ability to reason about conditionals. Practical takeaways of mental models. Inferring practical tips from a purely descriptive theory is often fraught. Research into general problem-solving heuristics encouraged a swath of researchers to consider instruction in problem-solving to be central, but we now realize that was probably a mistake. Similarly, while it's easy to squint at Johnson Lair's results and get takeaways, some of those are probably illusory. 
His finding that imagery may interfere with mental models shouldn't imply that suppressing mental imagery is necessarily helpful. Indeed, a lot of anecdotal evidence in math and physics suggests the opposite. With that caution in mind, a few tentative takeaways of mental models might include Number one, use pencil and paper to construct complete models for complex situations. Programmers, for instance, often introduce bugs into their code by failing to mentally simulate all the possible settings for variables and an unanticipated combination of settings results in an error. Working through all the possibilities on pencil and paper can help overcome an insufficiently powerful mental model. Number two, greater knowledge assists in reasoning. Knowledge modulates our interpretation of logical premises, according to mental model theory. So the logical interpretation of Jim's either in Rio or he's in Brazil includes the possibility, logically, that he's in Rio but not Brazil, except normal participants never consider that possibility because they know Rio is itself in Brazil. Greater knowledge, therefore, trims extraneous possibilities and allows for reasoning to proceed with less cost to working memory. Number three, use base rates to avoid the equiprobability of mental models. Johnson Laird argues that we reason about probabilistic events by constructing possibilities and weighing them equally by default. But this biases rare and unusual events in our reasoning. Plane crashes are very easy to visualize and they can occur as a distinct mental model possibility, but they actually occur rarely in real life, and so we overweight their likelihood compared to the thousands of interchangeable mental models when the plane lands without incident. Base rates, the practice of assigning probabilities based on the statistical likelihood of similar events, can improve risk calculations. Number four, discuss and share your mental models. It seems that a major weak point of human reasoning is that we struggle with generating counterexamples more than recognizing them. The famous waste and four card task tricks most participants, but accuracy improves greatly when people are allowed to discuss and explain their choices, as there is an increasing chance of successfully recognizing the key counterexamples. If you're interested in learning more about mental models and Johnson Laird's theory, I can't recommend more his original 1983 book, Mental Models, as well as his 2006 summary of the state of the theory, How We Reason. Thank you.